Hi, everybody. Welcome. We're going to get started in a few minutes. Still giving people a couple minutes to get into the meeting. Hopefully you got the email today with the book list and printed that out. If not, I, tr I tried to share it in the chat as a shared Google Doc. So you can try that if uh, you didn't get the PDF in your email today. Hello, everybody. Welcome. I've got a little bit after seven, so I am going to get started. And I'll keep admitting people as they come into the waiting room. If you have friends you know are going to join us, but they're not here yet. There's somebody right now. So welcome to Lake Oswego Public Library's Hot Books for Cold Reads. My name is Chris Myers. I am a librarian at Lake Oswego Public Library. And I do these talks twice a year, once in November to tell you about books uh, that are either new or forthcoming in the fall and into the holiday season. And then once in June to tell you about books you might wanna read in the, or check out in the summer. So the next one, if you enjoy this one, you wanna, Mark your calendar for the next one. It'll be Tuesday, June 14th. Um, and that one's called Cool Books for Hot Days. I, you can probably figure out the pattern of the naming now. And I am uh, grateful. My name is Chris Myers. I, I think I said that already. I'm grateful to one of our um, patrons who had signed up, but she couldn't come. But she emailed me on Sunday because she was concerned that the romance book section of the New York Times Book Review on Sunday was titled hot reads for cold days. And I think she thought maybe I should activate my, uh, the attorneys I have on retainer for intellectual property disputes. Uh, I'm gonna hold them back for now and we'll see how things go. Uh, but I do like the idea of an epic um, intellectual property dispute movie, kind of a David and Goliath um, story about a public librarian and the, one of the biggest media companies in the world battling out. And of course, I think Ryan Reynolds would play me. Um, so that's something to look forward to. Um, I am here because I like to read books and help other people find books to read for pleasure. And um, it's good reading weather. It's that time of year. There's a ton of good books coming out from our the publishing houses. Um, one thing I would say to you is that because of um, supply chain issues that are sort of a long-term effect of the pandemic. Uh, libraries and publishers are having trouble getting as many books into the um, people's hands as they would like to. So if you, if you love the sound of some of these books, get on the hold list at the library soon or order them from your local independent bookstore soon so that you can get them in time for the, for the holidays or when you want to read them. Mm -hmm. um, the list I'm going to share with you is very subjective. It's books that I've either read or am going to read very soon. I'm excited about reading. Um, and But because it's my subjective choices, uh, you should uh, bring some subjectivity to the list too and pick the ones that sound interesting to you and um, leave aside the ones that don't sound interesting or not your kind of book. And by all means, if you start a book that I recommended and you don't like it, put it aside. You don't, There's no need to finish a book that you don't like. Um, before I start, I want to tell you about a program uh, that's at the library starting today. It's a, um, it's 
in honor of Native American Heritage Month, which is the month of November. And this is an exhibit called Oregon is Indian Country. It's a cooperative um, effort between the Oregon Historical Society and the nine federally recognized tribes of Oregon. And it is three, three massive um, exhibit boards. One of the boards is at um, the library and two of them are over at Lake Oswego City Hall on uh, A Avenue. And it's described this way, the tribes describe it in their, um, in the text from their own point of view. This exhibit is about us, the nine federally recognized tribes of Oregon and our ancestors who have occupied these lands for thousands of years, long before Oregon became a state 150 years ago. Our cultures are extremely rich as expressed in our languages, histories, and traditions, which have nourished us since time immemorial despite dramatic changes and often against overwhelming odds. Organized by the Folklife Program of the Oregon Historical Society, in close cooperation with all nine tribes, this exhibit explores three themes from our, from our perspective. The land, our connections to the landscape, federal Indian policies, the federal policies that have affected us both in adverse and positive ways, and third, traditions that bind the cultural traditions that continue to nurture us. Nurture us. And that third one is the one that's at the library, the traditions that bind, and the two boards on the land, and um, federal Indian policies are over at City Hall. So check that out. Uh, Oregon is Indian country. It's on display all from, from today through December 8th. Um, so if you're in town or in the area, it's really, really interesting. Um, I'm gonna get started with the books. Hopefully you have your list. Um, oh, I was gonna say, you know, I would really much rather be in person with all of you and see you. Um, so the downside is I'm not actually with you personally. We're still on Zoom. Um, but the upside is there's people from Massachusetts and Washington, D.C. area who have been able to Zoom in. And also you can be in your pajamas or your sweats or your smoking jacket or whatever you usually like to wear to a Zoom book talk. And that's, that's really nice. So I'm glad you're all here. And I hope to someday see you in person at the library again, too. Let's get started. Um, I've divided these books. There's actually 32 books. I promised 30, but there's 32. Get bonus books. Divided these books into three categories, um, but you can, you know, categorize them as you like. First category is book club books. So these are books that are a little bit more substantive. They might have more kind of topics for your book club to sink your teeth into if that's the kind of book club you belong to. So the first book is Cloud Cuckoo Land by Anthony Doerr, the author of All the Light We Cannot See, which for which he won the Pulitzer Prize. And this is one of the most hyped books of the fall. And I will just tell you that um, I've read most of these books. I'll tell you when I haven't read the book. I've read this book and it totally lives up to the hype. It's a magical book. Um, that has three parallel storylines in three different time periods, one in 15th century Constantinople, one in present day Idaho involving eco-terrorists, and one in a, a, a ship out in deep space in the, in the future. And the three storylines are tied together by this ancient text called um, Cloud Cuckoo Land. Um, and the book is, uh, you know, I'm, it's not, it's, uh, I'm sort of the target audience for the book because it's a love song to books and libraries, but it's also just a really beautiful book about how words and stories uh, connect people. And if you look on the sheet, you'll see the page count is 620 pages, which I know is a daunting page number. I just want to say to you that it's a very uh, deceptively fast read because every time it shifts from one time period to the other, there's all this these blank pages in the book. So you actually move through the book pretty quickly. And I, it's more like a 450 page book um, in terms of how long it takes to read. Cloud Cuckoo Land by Anthony Dorr. Dispatches from Onerous Tales in Tribute to Ursula K. Le Guin is a really interesting and diverse collection of short stories and fables and tales by um, 31 different Oregon based authors. And it's put out by a Portland publishing company, Forest Avenue Press. Um, some of the best fantasy and science fiction authors in the area have contributed, um, including Lydia Nayaknovich and Molly Gloss and Curtis Chen and Fonda Lee. 
and they have a they each have a story in the collection and at the end they have a sh very short kind of paragraph long essay about what um Ursula K. Le Guin means to them um and I, in my opinion she's Oregon's greatest writer and her her impact is really broad ranging um Fonda Lee has I think the best story in the collection is called Old Souls and she also has the best author statement and uh, she'll come up later in the list because she has her own book on the list she says, Le Guin, more than any other author, taught me that speculative fiction is the genre of ideas. She destroyed any notion that writing and reading science fiction and fantasy were trivial or escapist activities, proving instead that only by expanding our imaginations to their utmost could we fully explore the human condition at its most intimate, nuanced, and real. So that's Dispatches from Anaris, a really, really interesting, um, wide-ranging collection. Uh, edited by Susan DeFreitas, who's a Portland writer. Uh, the Every by Dave Eggers is uh, his follow-up or sequel to The Circle from 2013. And in The Circle, you had a young woman, May Holland, who went to work um, for a fictional company that would be basically what you would get if uh, Facebook, Google, and Apple combined um, into one company. And in this book, Facebook, Google, and Apple have uh, purchased Amazon, and so they have to change the name of the company to the Every. And May Holland from The Circle is the CEO of this massive, all-controlling company. And um, our protagonist, Delaney Wells, is a young woman who goes to work for the Every with the secret goal of trying to destroy the Every because she feels like it's undermining the quality of life and taking away people's free will and ability to to live a quality life this is one of 32 uh dust covers that um the book has come with and dave eggers because he doesn't like amazon he can he considers it a bully um has offered the hardcover book only through independent bookstores and in a, a few weeks the paperback will be available through other more traditional venues, but I just strongly, strongly encourage you to buy your books, including this book through independent bookstores. As Dave Eggers says, this contributes to retail biodiversity. And so for those of us who love to go browse and look at a really nice, well-curated bookstore, the only way that bookstore is gonna to continue to exist is if we buy books from them. And Dave Eggers adds, you need to buy the book at the price that's printed on the book. So we're all, maybe a little bit attached to the deep discounts that Amazon gives, but um, Amazon uses those discounts as a loss leader and they're really, it's really predatory pricing by Amazon. So um, a lot of themes there. This book is actually really, really funny in parts, but also extremely chilling. Um, the Every by Dave Eggers. Hurricane lizards and plastic squids. I always wanna say squids, but I guess the plural in this case is squid. The Fraught and Fascinating Biology of Climate Change by Thor Hansen. Thor Hansen is the guy who you would have wanted to sit next to in uh, science class in high school, not because you're gonna cheat off him, but because he'd be making really funny comments under his breath and he'd be really engaged with the material and you'd wanna you know, absorb some of his knowledge by osmosis and glom onto his study group and just learn with him and beside him. This book isn't, um, issuing a warning about climate change, as he says in the beginning of the book, because those warnings are already out there and they still stand. And we've all, most of us have accepted those warnings uh, and, the, and climate change as something we're dealing with. Um, what he's doing instead, because he's a conservation biologist, is looking at how climate change is affecting different species of animals and different um, aspects of the ecology. Um, and it's a really, really interesting uh, book. It's about, it's really only about 200 pages long because there's a bunch of notes at the end. But for example, one concept he talks about is that um, scientists now talk about not global warming, but global weirding where changes in the uh, climate and temperature, especially in the ocean where all the temperature changes are magnified are creating weird, strange bedfellows among different species and then uh, traditional predators don't aren't there to control other species as he's for, for example he says some of the most extreme weirding wasn't 
flying over the waves, but swimming and drifting beneath them. Warming ocean temperatures and altered currents have moved so many things from lower latitudes toward the poles in so many places that marine biologists are calling the trend tropicalization. Along one stretch of Northern California coastline, recent surveys documented 37 species leaping an average of 215 miles north in only four years, including barnacles, sea slugs, snails, crabs, algae, and the bottlenose dolphin. Dozens of additional sightings were deemed so far from home that scientists marked them down, for now at least, as scouts rather than settlers. A two-ton hoodwinker sunfish, for example, wasn't just the first one documented for the state, it was the first recorded in the entire hemisphere. That is hurricane lizards and plastic squid, the fraught and fascinating biology of climate change by Thor Hansen. Matrix by Lauren Groff is a novel in purely literary terms. This is the best book on this list and it's the best book that I've read so far this year and I've read about 95 books. I'm having a really great reading year thanks to COVID. Not a lot of time to concentrate on books. Um, this is um, a book about, a, it's, a, it's a really, really well done piece of historical fiction about a woman named Marie de France, who is a very obscure poet in, 12th century, in the 12th century, and she comes from France to England. And she, the historical record has a few of her little poems called Lays, L-A-I-S, and from those Lays, Lauren Groff has built this story about Marie de France going being banished by Eleanor of Aquitaine, who was her, I think, aunt, to a nunnery where, at age 17, because Marie's too tall and too plain to be in court. And so she has to go live with the nuns and become a nun. And uh, eventually, well, pretty quickly, she becomes the abbess of the abbey, the leader. And she has to help this, um, convent get off its knees it's it's stricken by poverty and illness disease um, and it's it's such a great story of um, female power of women in community um, of the way religion can empower people um, and it has some great action sequences it's I know you were not expecting me to say this about a book about nuns but it's pretty sexy in parts it is just really a great novel and at 260 pages it is a marvel of economic storytelling it's shortlisted for the national book award it's in the final five i think it should win but i don't get to choose um it's also shortlisted for the american library association's um carnegie medal for fiction that's only three books get that uh, next, Once There Were Wolves by Charlotte McConaughey. If you've ever heard me talk about books, you know that I do judge books by their cover. And when I looked at this cover, I thought, wow, that's a boring cover. And then I thought, please don't let this be about werewolves. And um, so I was very happy to learn that A, it's not about werewolves, and B, it's the farthest thing from a boring book. This is a gripping novel about, um, it's realistic fiction about a young biologist from Australia named Inti, who is leading a team that's reintroducing wolves into the present day Scottish Highlands in the same way that they, they in real life, they were introduced into Yellowstone National Park um, 15 or 20 years ago. And uh, of course she runs into great resistance from local sheep herders who are worried about their sheep being eaten by wolves and other locals who are just resistant to her and her sister who's come along with her because they're outsiders. Um, they're um, a, a man in town who's clearly a wife beater ends up dead and it looks like a wolf has um, attacked him and killed him so Inti buries his body and no one can ever find him and he just has disappeared. So there's a mystery, there's suspense. Um, the book is about how nature and people interact, but it's also about male violence and it's about sisterhood and family. It's a really, really great book that works on a lot of different levels. Once There Were Wolves by Charlotte McConaughey. One Friday in April, A Story of Suicide and Survival. Again, this, this is a heavy book. Uh, it's only 144 pages long, but every word weighs because Donald Antrim, who is a novelist, is writing about and reflecting on his own 
<clears throat> long struggle with what he would call suicide. And he, he uses that word to describe the condition and sort of an illness rather than the act of dying by suicide. So in one this Friday in April, it's in the title in 2006, he was so overcome by suicide that he was on the roof of his Brooklyn apartment. He was hanging by both hands from the fire escape and then letting go with one hand and then re-gripping. And he was, so he was close to succumbing to suicide. Uh, so the book looks, starts with that event and then it goes backwards to talk about how he got there. And then it goes forward to talk about how he recovered from that. And he's doing well now. He won a MacArthur Genius Grant a few years ago. <clears throat> but I think this is a book is a really important um, and concise contribution to our evolving societal understanding of suicide and how we talk about it and think about it. Uh, I want to read to you the, the, where he talks about how he uses the word suicide. He says, when telling the story of my illness, I try not to speak about depression. I prefer to call it suicide. The American novelist William Styron in his memoir, Darkness Visible, a Memoir of Madness, argues that the word depression is inadequate to describe this illness, and I agree. A depression is a concavity, a sloping downward and a return. Suicide, in my experience, is not that. I believe that suicide is a natural history, a disease process, not an act or a choice, a decision or a wish. I do not understand suicide as a response to pain or as a message to the living. I do not think of suicide as the act, the death, the fall from a height or the trigger pulled. I see it as a long illness, an illness with origins in trauma and isolation in deprivation of touch, in violence and neglect, in the loss of home and belonging. It is the disease of the body and the brain, if you make that distinction, but its etiology, its beginning, whether in early or later life in the family or beyond, is social in nature. I see suicide as a social disease. I will refer to suicide, not depression. That's One Friday in April by Donald Antrim. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's Native American History Month, and not for that reason, but coincidentally, there are two Native authors on this list. This is a memoir by Joy Harjo, the Poet Laureate of the United States, um, and it's called Poet Warrior. Uh, it's her second volume of memoir. Her first one, uh, Crazy Brave, came out um, in 2008. And you don't have to have read Crazy Brave to read this book. Um, she's now 70 years old. She's a Muscogee Creek Indian, and she's looking back at her life from a position of age and experience. And um, it's really, really moving, really, really interesting and kind of um, impressionistic. Uh, there are a lot of her poems in the book, and also, as with a lot of poets, her prose is, is pretty poetic, too. And you get the sense of how much spirituality there is in uh, found it by Native Americans in nature and, and in the material world. Here she briefly is, I really like this description she has of a cooking pot that's passed through many, many generations in her family to her. Some of the most important stories are not in words, not in poems or other forms of speaking, but in objects of use and beauty. This cooking pot is one of the most potent stories I carry made at the end of the century before last, one of many such pots used by native people east of the Mississippi. The one that was passed through generations of women came to me from my mother. It tells of survival of the labors of women who cooked, cleaned and uplifted everyone with stories and songs. The pot is sitting by my feet while I am writing this. It was pressed with fury and fire. It was made of the same materials as weapons. It made soup and fed those who gathered around it to eat. In hard times, soup was water of a few bones and hope. Other times, thick and boiling with meat, vegetables, and herbs. It was feast and laughing. It's the same kind of pot we used at the ceremonial grounds for squirrel soup. My mother planted flowers in it. It was my only request from her belongings when she passed. This is Poet Warrior, a memoir by Joy Harjo. Uh, this book I have not read. This is the only book in this section that I haven't read, the, but I have read uh, the 1619 Project um, insert of the New York Times Magazine from which this is an expanded book length um, project. So in August of 2019, uh, the New York Times devoted its entire Sunday magazine to the 1619 Project, which was um, 
history and analysis and sociology based on the 400 year anniversary of the first, the arrival of the first captives from Africa on um, North American soil. And so it's looking at the origins of our nation through the lens of um, slavery and black captivity. And for that reason, it's very controversial, the 1619 Project. Um, conservative historians, for example, have criticized it and Nicole Hannah-Jones, its editor and compiler, because it's it varies from the kind of heroic image of America as a country um, created by virtuous people who were rebelling against tyranny. And I would submit to you that um, it's not one or the other, and we can understand our country's history, and it's a very complicated history, best by looking at it through a variety of lenses. And so this is, um, as, the as the subtitle says, a new origin story, not the origin story, but a new origin story and a different way to look at our country's roots beginning. The 1619 Project, edited by Nicole Hannah-Jones. Three Girls from Bronzeville by Dawn Turner is a memoir of her childhood and adolescence and um, coming into adulthood in the Bronzeville neighborhood of Chicago, which is kind of like the Harlem of Chicago. And it's uh, it offers a really um, insightful and granular look at life in um, a predominantly black part of, of an American city. And it also offers really, um, I think, important messages about um, ambition and family and um, generational um, poverty and um, struggles. Um, really great book. And I think it's a good antidote to um, the kind of dehumanizing talk that some politicians do about like inner cities and um, crime ridden American cities. Uh, this it humanizes um, urban blacks. Three Girls from Bronzeville by Don Turner. Okay, we are moving to the fun reads. And again, uh, you define what's fun for you, but then we're going to sweep across some genres here. And um, uh, you, you choose the ones that are interesting to you. This is a debut legal thriller by a, an author who uh, used to be a corporate attorney. So she's writing from experience. It's about um, Elise Littlejohn, who is a um, young uh, black attorney in Atlanta. She's having an affair with her white boss at the firm when he um, suddenly uh, ends up shot to death uh, in his office. And um, she, Elise, ends up pulled into this web of um, suspicion, conspiracy. Um, so it's got some elements of, for example, the firm, but a great legal thriller. The Death of Jane Lawrence by a Portland author, Caitlin Starling. Um, I'm about halfway through this book and it is just a super creepy Gothic romance. This, um, I forgot to acknowledge my colleague, Cindy Reed, who made these really fun slides, but she picked a perfect, photo down here at the, the bottom of the side of this house. Uh, this young woman, Jane, um, decides that it's time for her to get married. So she kind of looks at the uh, roster of the eligible men in the town where she lives in what seems to be a slightly fictionalized version of England and picks a doctor, Mr. Lawrence, Dr. Lawrence, and uh, they marry as sort of a business arrangement. And she's living at his his hospital, essentially. Then she comes to find that he has this house out in the country that's very much a haunted mansion, literally haunted with the ghost of his dead ex-wife. Uh, and he hadn't told her about either of these things. Um, and it is really, really fun and suspenseful. Gothic romance, horror, haunted mansion, the death of Jane Lawrence. This is the funniest book that I have read in this second half of the year, Fight Night by Miriam Caves. You might be wondering what the funniest book that I read in the first half of the year was, and those were, there were two 
Early Morning Riser by Katherine Heine, which was on my summer list, and along with The Liar's Dictionary by E. Lee Williams. So if you want to have a laugh with some serious literature around it, this is a great book. Miriam Taves is a Canadian novelist, and she said in interviews that um, she's basically writing one big book. And so each novel she writes, and she's written about eight, is sort of an installment, and they all have characters who are kind of based on people in her life, like herself and her mom, Elvira, um, and her sister who committed suicide and her dad who also committed suicide. So there's some trauma in Miriam Taves' life. And uh, she also has escaped from a very strict Mennonite community in rural Canada. So all these things are elements, but here you have the story based around a nine-year-old girl named Swiv, who is a very, very funny, precocious observer of the world. And she's um, taken care of and being taken care of by her aging, decrepit uh, grandmother, Elvira, who has the same name as Miriam Taves' mother. Um, and Swiv's mom is very pregnant. So she's pretty distracted and she's very, very anxious and sort of struggles with some mental health. And uh, Swiv's dad has disappeared. Um, and so uh, I know that doesn't, none of that sounds that funny. Um, and Miriam Taves it described the book in an interview I heard um, as a, a child's guide to death and madness. <laughs> so, the, so it's dark humor, but it's also, there's also a lot of slapstick. And um, Swiv is one of my favorite characters that I've encountered this year. And I wanna read just a brief episode here. Swiv has taken her grandmother Elvira to get her um, nails done and now um, she's helping her get back on the streetcar. On the streetcar home nothing embarrassing happened except for grandma asking me if I'd had a bowel movement that day but she whispered it. She was making progress. There was hardly anybody on the streetcar except for a man who told us an alien had stuck a transmitter into his ass and was tracking him. Grandma said ouch. And he said it, he can't feel it anymore, but he knows it's there. Then grandma and the man started talking about the Raptors. So his grandma's a real big sports fan. And the man couldn't believe how much grandma knew about basketball. She showed off by telling him all sorts of stats. The man said there were some things that were easy to learn about just by watching TV like the Raptors. And there were other things that were harder like aliens having to learn about humans by implanting transmitters into their butts. Grandma told the man that was very true. She'd rather learn by watching TV than by putting devices into people's rear ends. The man said, well, true is true. It's like unique. It can't be very true or somewhat unique. It's just true and it's just unique. And then he said, you get me? I said, I get you, I get you. We all fist bumped. The man sighed really hard after that like he just finished all his work for the day. This is Fight Night by Miriam Taves. Fuzz when nature breaks the law. Okay, I'll amend what I said earlier, which is that I if I was in science class in history in high school, I'd want Thor Hansen, the author of Hurricane Lizards on one side of me and Mary Roach on the other, because they both have this great um, fun uh, approach to science. And I'm really uh, ashamed to admit this is the first book by Mary Roach I've read, and now I'm gonna need to backtrack <clears throat> and read her other books uh, because she writes with expertise, but also with a, a, a lot of humor and um, a really kind of friendly, casual tone. Um, and th the topic of this book is places where um, animals and plants kind of infringe on uh, human civilization. So and how do humans respond to that? And like, so bears coming out of the mountains and the forest in um, Colorado and getting into the uh, garbage cans of really rich people in Aston or in Aspen and, you know, in their back alleys, uh, marauding elephants in India that will literally kill people, but they, the humans won't kill the elephants because the elephants are considered sacred. Um, Things like a lot of, and then uh, birds, crows that are eating crops and how do we control them? And is there any way to do so? Um, it's really, really interesting. It's a really fast read. Um, and 
Uh, if you like that, then she's got a lot, a lot more where that came from. Fuzz, When Nature Breaks the Law by Mary Roach. Harlem Shuffle by Colson Whitehead. Uh, Colson Whitehead won the Pulitzer Prize for his last two novels. Um, the Nickel Boys and The Underground Railroad, which were both very serious books um, about the struggle of Blacks in America, one in the time of slavery and one in the 20th century. Um, and they were just beautiful, uh, really moving books. This book is entirely different and he's like very versatile. He's written a zombie novel. Uh, he's written a book about nonfiction book about poker. And this is a crime novel set in the sixties in Harlem. It's really funny. Um, it's really fast paced. Um, and it's very much a genre book. So he's not going to win the Pulitzer for this because genre books tend not to win the Pulitzer, but it is still a great book. And it's about a furniture uh, store owner, Ray Carney in Harlem. And as Ray Carney likes to say, um, you know, he's a little bit into uh, the world, the, the underworld, but not told. He's kind of got a toe in the world, the criminal world. And he says he's only slightly bent when it comes to being crooked. Um, but he's got a cousin, Freddie, who keeps kind of pulling him into the world of crime. Um, and there's basically three really distinct acts. Uh, the first one is he gets um, pulled by his cousin, Freddie, into a heist at this uh, famous uh, hotel for Blacks in Harlem, the Hotel Teresa that's pictured here. Um, and it goes from there. It's really, really, a really fun read. Harlem Shuffle by Colson Whitehead. Jade Legacy by Fonda Lee, as you can see on the list at the, at the end of the entry, I have a date if it, the book's not out yet. This one's not coming out till the end of November. So you have till then to read the first two books in this awesome, epic fantasy, martial arts, crime family uh, trilogy uh, by a Portland author. The one that I mentioned when I was talking about the Ursula K. Le Guin book. Um, these books are so great. You really do need to read them in order. So uh, if it's interesting to you, start with Jade City, which won the World Fantasy Award as the best fantasy novel of 2017. Then go on to Jade War. And then this 700 page book, Jade Legacy, will bring it all home. Um, I haven't read it yet, but I've got a big vacation coming up and I can't wait to read it. Jade Legacy by Fonda Lee. Um, again, I mentioned I do judge books by their cover. I love this cover. It's one of the most perfect covers for the book itself that I've seen. Uh, this is a book that's, um, it's basically a soap opera about a Mexican-American family um, who are, all have secrets and who are all trying to deal with different types of marital relationship problems. The, main, the patriarch of the family, Oscar, is obsessed with the weather. He just sits in his easy chair, kind of catatonic, watching the weather channel. And his wife, Kayla, who's a sculptor, cannot figure that why he's so obsessed with the weather. And Oscar's got a secret reason why he's obsessed with the weather. Meanwhile, their three daughters are um, pretty um, accomplished women, but they're all, they all have their own secrets about how their marriages are kind of unraveling. Um, it's, but it's a very funny book. The family has a really buoyant spirit and it's a sweet book. I'll just give you a content warning. It starts with a really traumatic incident where um, Kayla and Oscar's grandchildren almost drown in the, the pool because they're not paying enough attention to the kids, but the kids do survive. But I just, I don't, I, I started reading the book. I was like, wait a second, this is not the book I thought it was going to be. Uh, but it's mostly, it's like a telenovela. So um twisty and melodramatic and funny in parts. This is LA Weather by Maria Amparo Escandon. Lady Sunshine, also by a Portland author, Amy Mason Doan. This is her third book. I've read all three. I think this is her best book. It's a coming of age novel um, written for adults, but it'd be a great um, book for young adults too. And it's about Jackie, who's um, she's a high schooler who for in the summer is sent to um, spend the summer at her uncle's estate on the coast in California. Her uncle's a famous pop rock singer. And um, there, Jackie becomes really good friends with her cousin, Willa. And, but tragedy um, overtakes the compound there, and Willa disappears. 
So that's in 1979. The story flashes forward 20 years um, to 1999 when Jackie is, uh, is, inherits the estate, which is called the Sandcastle. And when she goes back there to look at what she's inherited, she starts to um, uncover all these secrets about what happened back in 1979. It's a really, really entertaining book um, filled with nostalgia and um, kind of the sweet sweetness of adolescence. Lady Sunshine. Love in the Big City, I have not read yet because it's not out yet, but this is a Korean novel. Um, now translated, and it's about a uh, millennial um, gay man in Seoul trying to, um, you know, find a relationship, find his footing. I'll read you the um, comment from Indie Next, which is kind of the consortium of independent bookstores. And this is actually, this is coincidentally from a Powell's book employee, Adam Postle. He says, I've never read a book with a voice like Sung Young Park brings to this novel. Young, queer, Korean, unafraid to tackle important issues while remaining funny, edgy, and approachable. I can't wait to read whatever he writes next. That's Love in the Big City by Sung Young Park. My Heart is a Chainsaw by Stephen Graham Jones. Uh, as you can tell from the cover, this is a full on horror novel. It is um, gory and um, but also very funny in parts and really entertaining. It's about a high school senior named Jay Daniels who lives in this tiny podunk town on a lake in Idaho. And everyone calls her the horror girl because she's obsessed with horror movies. Um, and she writes all her high school papers about horror movies. Um, and across the lake, there's this big development um, is, springing up uh, created by really wealthy people for you know from the tech world and and they're going to live there and they're sort of taking over the town um, but in this setting with the town and this big development going in suddenly dead bodies start turning up and Jade is convinced that she's kind of in a horror movie or what she calls a slasher a slasher movie and so she's applying all the tropes of slasher movies to what is happening in the town. And she's trying to convince any adult who will listen that there is a serial killer on the loose and um, all these deaths are connected. And no one of course will believe her. This is My Heart is a Chainsaw, a great story. And Jade is a really um, many layered character, very memorable. Small Pleasures by Claire Chambers is one of the loveliest books I've read this year. It is um, uh, set in 1957 uh, in the suburbs outside London. Uh, a journalist, Jean Swinney, has a pretty dreary life where she just, she's home along with her aging, extremely demanding and uh, irritable mother. And then at work, she's treated as a second-class citizen because she's a, a woman. And so the, uh, all the men who work at the paper are sh always shunting her off to write about women's issues. But she gets her big break when um, a woman named Gretchen Tilbury writes a letter to the paper and says, I believe that my 10-year-old daughter, Margaret, is the product of a virgin birth. And this is based on a, you can see this, um, newspaper headline that Cindy put in here based on a true uh, claim by a woman. So Jean goes to uh, investigate and write about um, Gretchen's claim that she had a virgin birth. And in so doing, uh, she learns a lot about Gretchen. She starts to fall in love with Gretchen's husband, Howard, and she becomes very attached to their 10-year-old daughter, Margaret, who's really sweet. Um, this is a book that it's it's funny and it's got a lot of twists. It's, it would be make a perfect you know BBC limited series. Um, and Jean is a great character. Small Pleasures by Claire Chambers. <coughs> Under the Whispering Door. These next two I have not read. I have read T.J. Clune's previous book, 
called The House in the Cerulean Sea. And he, that book is one of the nicest, sweetest, most heartwarming, funny books I've read in a long time. And it's, uh, I would call it, uh, the genre would be queer fantasy. And that's TJ Klune's um, genre. And I, he's an author that I've discovered this year. I'm really happy to have found him and I can't wait to read this book. Uh, I'll read you the description of this uh, from the author Cassandra Ka, who says that this book is a warm hug of a book about a Grinch of a man who dies and a ferryman who helps the dead in their journey onwards. Under the Whispering Door is a kind book, full of faith in the goodness of people, full of kind people showing how compassion is a strength. It broke my heart with its unflinching understanding that grief never goes away, never empties, only settles into the room of your soul like a strange souvenir, and then it healed me in the next breath. That sounds great. This is Under the Whispering Door by T.J. Klune. All right, so uh, this is You Sexy Thing by Kat Rambo. Again, I haven't read this yet. Can't wait to read it. If you've heard me talk about books before, you know that I love a good space opera. What is a space opera? That's a soap opera set out in space. So this is about um, a military commander of a space station, Nico Larson. She's a former admiral. She thinks she's retired from the long running war and she can now just be with her friends and run their uh, restaurant that they have together called The Last Chance, but they keep getting pulled back into um, conflict and war. And because it's a space opera, there's going to be romance, there's going to be action, there's going to be melodrama, there's going to be humor. Uh, Locus, which is a science fiction magazine, describes this book this way, a fast zippy novel that hides some surprisingly substantial emotional heavy lifting under its hood cozy with a sousson of suspense a hoot and a half you sexy thing by kate rambo okay we are moving into our final category gift books and i put these under gift books because they might be targeted at someone in your life who has a specific interest such as the person you know who really loves sports i love a good sports book i am currently listening to this book on audiobook and billy jean king reads it herself and it's fantastic. She's got this very endearing lisp and she's so passionate and enthusiastic about her life and the causes that she has advanced. Um, uh, and so it's just everything. It's like a really interesting life, well told. And the thing about Billie Jean King is that she was the number one player in women's tennis from about 1966 to about 19. 75 or so when Chrissy Everett and Martina Navratilova started to take over for her. But she was the rare person who was the best in her sport who and used that spotlight and that microphone to advance social justice and causes. And she started with the cause of uh, women's equality in sports and trying to create a women's professional tennis tour against incredible sexism and resistance from men. And then she moved on to um, civil rights, gay rights, uh, and, and more and more issues. And she's a hero. She was a great businesswoman. And, and now and she's got such a great story to tell. And it's a really good mix of sports and um, the social issues. This is All In by Billie Jean King. All of the Marvels by Douglas Wolk. And by the way, um, Starting today, but it kind of peaks on Saturday is the Portland Book Festival. So, uh, for example, Douglas Wolk, who's a Portlander, will be at the Portland Book Festival talking about this book. And I will stipulate that I am not interested in comic books that much at all. I, when I was a little kid, I read Richie Rich, but I was not into superhero comics, and I'm still not really. Um, but this is a book uh, about superhero comics more specifically the Marvel superhero comics. And what Douglas Wolk did, because he's a scholar of superhero comics, is he read 27,000 comic books, Marvel comic books. And he has synthesized and analyzed the major 
plot lines, um, interconnectedness, the characters, the themes. And again, I am not that interested in comics, but he does such a good job and it is absolutely fascinating. And of course he does tie it into the Marvel Cinematic Universe if you've seen some of those movies, but mostly he's interested in the comic books. And I'll tell you, I'll read something that he says about how you might dive into these. Caring about superhero comics will empty your pockets, break your heart, and fill you with red-eyed indignation. But what makes it worthwhile for me and for at least some other people who follow serial superhero comics is that there is a particular deep kind of joy that comes from that practice. Read a half a dozen of Marvel's better comics and you might get the buzz of a good adventure story, see some striking artwork, and be introduced to a few memorable characters read a hundred and you start to get a sense of what their devotees find special, that they add up to a collaborative story built for delight whose various tellers specific visions are its most important aspect. Read a thousand and every little detail of them becomes charged with meaning as another world, which is also a stranger, more vivid version of our own world is slowly revealed to you, a world of constant spectacle and drama, so broad and complicated that its mysteries perpetually unfold over hundreds of pages every week. This is All of the Marvels by Douglas Wolk, and this is for the person on your gift list who's really into superhero comics, or who just wants to read a great nonfiction book. All right, so uh, this is a young adult book by two great young adult writers who are collaborating. It's the start of a duology, so it'll be a two book series. Some young adult books are about, you know, the sweetness and the awkwardness and the gawkiness of adolescence. And some books are about the, the viciousness and the difficulty of, uh, of adolescence. And this is the latter category. It's, uh, it's like Hunger Games. Um, and I, it's coming out, it came out maybe today. I know it's en route to the light. I have a hold on it, it's coming for me, so I can't wait to read it. But um, it's described this way in Indie Next. If one of the victors of the Hunger Games published a tell-all book, the result would be All of Us Villains. Shocking and enthralling, unique and suspenseful. All of Us Villains is the best kind of wild ride and I'm eagerly anticipating the sequel. And the author, Victoria Lee says, Dark, luscious, and brutally smart, All of Us Villains is a fresh but unforgiving look at the legacy of abusive families and community-sanctioned violence. All of Us Villains by Amanda Foody and Christine Lynn Herman. Okay, Black Food, uh, Stories, Art, and Recipes from Across the African Diaspora by Bryant Terry. Bryant Terry is a chef and cookbook author and sustainable food activist for... The last six years, he's been the chef in residence at um, the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco, which I didn't even know was there before I started researching this book talk. Um, but uh, next time I'm in San Francisco, I really want to check it out. And this book, um, as the subtitle um, describes, it's art and recipes and uh, commentary and analysis um, about um, black food culture and food adjacent um, aspects of culture. Um, but it keeps coming back to the food and the recipes and they're it's really broad ranging. So for example, uh, here's a one recipe. This is called doubles, which is um, he describes as the favorite street food in Trinidad and Tobago. And so it's a fried kind of uh, almost fry bread type flatbread. And then um, but curried chickpeas with a cucumber salsa. Um, and it's a, he's most famous for vegan cookbooks and vegan food, but he does use uh, animal proteins in this cookbook, but this is a vegan recipe, for example. And then this is not a picture from the book. This is a picture from a Bon Appetit article about the book. Um, and here there's a tarragon um, grape, uh, cooler drink where uh, grapes, frozen grapes are used instead of um, ice cubes, which I think is a brilliant idea. And that's a non-alcoholic, nice um, punch kind of drink. Um, and then this orange cocoa catfish down in the foreground and sweet potato grits 
Um, and then I think it's a cardamom coffee cake. So, the, you know, there's a quite a range of recipes in this book uh, from all these different African traditions. It looks really delicious. And uh, Laura and I bought the book um, and we can't wait to dig into it. Okay, don't hug Doug, he doesn't like it, is a very sweet picture book by Carrie Finnison with uh, drawings by Daniel Weissman. I always like to credit the, uh, the illustrator. And it's about a cute little boy, Doug, who like um, our, you know, you've met this kid, our middle son, Henry is like this, he, you know, he just doesn't want to be hugged. And um, there are certain people it's okay to hug him, like mostly just his mom and his dad. So uh, it's a book about, you know, neurodiversity and how different kids respond differently to the physical world, but it's also a book about um, consent. Here's a, a funny uh, spread. I'll read it to you in case you can't see it very well. On the left is a picture of Doug um, and two girls celebrating his birthday. And the text is, so no matter how huggable he looks, no matter how much you want to, even if it's his birthday, please don't hug Doug. And Doug says, I'm just not a hugger. And on the next page, a woman asks him, what about hello hugs? Doug says, no. What about goodbye hugs? Doug says, nope. And they're fist bumping. What about game winning home run hugs? Nah. -uh. What about dry, dropped ice cream cone hugs? Doug says, still no, but I'd love another scoop. That is don't hug Doug. Gastro Obscura, a food adventurer's guide is a massive, really, really richly illustrated book from the people who brought you Atlas Obscura, which was lots and lots of odd sites around the world that you might want to see. And this is that same approach to food, really covers the whole world. Japan alone has like 15 pages of really interesting stuff. For example, this uh, entry on sumo wrestler stew from Chonkonabe, Japan. Sumo wrestling has no separate weight classes, which means the heavier competitor has the advantage. In recent years, largely due to an influx of Hawaiian and Mongolian wrestlers, the average weight of champions has soared from just under 300 pounds in the 1930s to well over 400 today. To keep up, Japanese wrestlers eat, sorry, chunkonabe is not the place, it's the food. Japanese wrestlers eat chunkonabe, a, a stew they consume with ritualistic regularity at nearly every meal for the duration of their career. Chunkonabe is a big communal pot of bubbling broth to which ingredients are continually added and removed in a process similar to shabu shabu or hot pot. Each training house typically has a signature broth recipe, which may be chicken, soy, or salt based. Into the broth goes fish or meat, tofu and vegetables, and chunks of calorie dense mochi, a starchy cake made from pounded glutinous rice. The sumo stew is cheap, hearty, fair, and in ordinary quantities, not intrinsically fattening. But sumo wrestlers skip breakfast to work up an appetite, then eat as many as 10 bowls of chonkonabe for lunch, washed down with copious amounts of beer. After lunch, the wrestlers nap. This is Gastro Obscura, a food adventurer's guide by Cecily Wong and Dylan Thuris. Girly Drinks, A World History of Women and Alcohol is a really fun and um, casual introduction to um, the history of alcohol through the eyes and experience of women by an author named Mallory O'Meara, whose first book, um, the, the Lady from the Black Lagoon, was a revisionist film history piece about the woman who uh, designed the Creature from the Black Lagoon costume and got no credit for it because um, Hollywood has always been so sexist. And she takes the same approach here where she's, uh, it's a really feminist approach to um, drinks and drinking. And you'll learn a lot. Like I've already learned, I thought Ninkasi, the name of the Eugene Beer Company was the name of you know, a Japanese family down in Eugene that started this brewery, but it's in fact the name of the ancient Sumerian uh, goddess of beer. So lots to learn here. And uh, you know, you could have a cocktail while you're learning about this. Girly drinks, Mallory O'Meara. 
Tacky love letters to the worst culture we have to offer by Rex King. I think Cindy ran out of uh, energy on this slide. Uh, Rex King is a cultural commentator and she has a regular column called store bought is fine about TV chefs, food media and the class barriers of cuisine. And in these 14 essays, she as a millennial is uh, giving a very kind of analytical, um, but really funny, but and more gentle uh, without irony approach or um, treatment of some of the low culture parts of uh, millennial culture, like sex in the city, snakeskin pants, cheesecake factories, gargantuan menu, Jersey Shore and Guy Fieri. That's tacky love letters to the worst culture we have to offer. And finally, Tunnel is a, uh, graphic novel by Rutu Modan. It's translated um, and it tells basically a story kind of like Raiders of the Lost Ark, but based on the true um, effort by um, a lot of different archeologists um, and these kind of cross political, cross cultural teams in, uh, in the Middle East to try to dig up and find the Ark of the Covenant. Um, Publishers Weekly call, I haven't seen this yet, it's not out yet. Publishers Weekly calls it the very best kind of satire. Modon embraces political absurdity, subverting ridiculous aspects of faith and fanaticism while never devolving to mockery. So if you're interested in a graphic novel, never tried one, you should try one. Um, that's Tunnels by Rutu Modon. Um, thank you again to Cindy Reed, my colleague who did these great slides. Thank you all for being here.